this is very exciting for us. Uh, we're very excited to uh, sort of kick off uh, this, um, this idea of making and the emphasis that the school is giving on making uh, to this uh, event uh, where we invited uh, some uh, fantastic artists and, and thinkers and friends. And uh, it's very exciting that the school is in this uh, uh, place where, um, thanks to Amal and to Artina Amal and Rouse and to Josh Jordan, uh, there is a real attention to making and to what that means, and in particular also to thinking. Um, you know, the, the fabrication lab, that it could just be renamed the making studio, right? So the emphasis is all on the idea that making is not just about representation. Uh, it's really more of a conceptual endeavor. I am Ada Tolla. I'm one of the partners at Lotech. Um, we've been, Giuseppe and I have been in the school for 15 years, and um, our work has always been somehow oddly physical. When GSAP was really interested in uh, digital culture, we asked our students to make a book. And they worked on a monograph, which was the most favorite school in the entire school. Then GSAP got interested in digital fabrication, and we're asking our students to make this really essential volume starting from single material in the main workshop. So our work is always a little bit at odds with the school, um, but we do that because uh, we believe that uh, there is real value in the idea of uh, approaching making from a conceptual stand. Um, we ask our students that their work is about testing and investigating, that is uh, exploratory, that that the work hesitates, that doesn't try to find answers, but rather to raise questions. We ask our students that the work is very subjective, is very personal, is very much about themselves. Um, in that sense, we also ask that the work is uncool, that they don't worry about cool, that they worry about really what they have to say. Um, we also ask that the work is obsessive, uh, our methodology is very iterated. We ask them to do things and then, and then do them again and again and again and again. We believe that they, there is real value in repetition and iteration, and that uh, somehow this is also therapeutic. That by doing things over and over, you are also operating some kind of therapy. We also ask our students to look very close, to look at things that are very close to their life, very close to the space that they inhabit, uh, very, very close to what they already know, what's already with them, uh, their mind, their hands, their skill. Um, underlying our classes, there is very much the desire to push the idea of a personal voice, um, to explore interests and curiosity, but also to explore your own skills. So uh, it, the work is very much suspended between what you like, what you're interested in, and what you're good at, and finding the bridge between the two. So uh, to trigger this event, I want to read from a piece of writing from uh, another kind of maker, from uh, David Goldblatt, who's a photographer. My first awareness of a bodily particular that I can recall was that the bulges made by the flattened flesh of my inner thighs as I sat in shorts on a bench at kindergarten. From where I sat, my bulges seemed more pronounced than anyone else's, and I tried to hide them with my hands. After a time, I realized that my inner thighs were no different than others, but it remained an area of the body of which I was especially aware. I have never been able to decide whether my sense of people's body is something I share with others, or whether mine is different, or perhaps more acute nor am I sure of how long I've had it. What I do know is that it has been for me, with me for a very long time, and that it is often intense and detailed. I seem to have an innate propensity which has been fed by life experiences and heightened by the hyper-awareness that photography sometimes enables and demands. Of my life experiences, one that was crucial was that of working in my father's shop in Ramfontein where I acquired a consciousness of bodily particulars that was technical rather than subjective. My father was a man outfitter, 
whose ability to intuit and remember and satisfy customers' needs was almost legendary. The wife of a miner who had once worked on Ramfontaine's estate and who was now on a property in the bush hundreds of miles away, my phony men say, Eli, our daughter is getting married and Tom needs a new suit and shirt, tie, shoes and socks to go with it. That was all she needed to tell him. Within hours, an outfit would be in the post. Trousers altered to fit. Sizes, colors and style, unerringly right for the men his tastes and the occasion. Under my father's kindly yet firm guidance, I became reasonably skilled at applying some of his precepts, one of which was never ever to ask a customer his size. It was our job to know or to discover the right size and to sell him clothes that fitted, that appealed to his tastes and that was right for his purpose. Thus it was that I learned to be conscious of how a man's body was of how he stood and was proportioned, to estimate and measure the girth and length of trunk, arms, and legs, so that they could be brought to a proper congruity with jackets and trousers, and as well to understand likings and needs and how this might be best satisfied. I learned to look at a man and his feet, their length, build, and, build, and uh, breadth, and to judge what shoe size feeling and make, and last, to, to try and make in order to find what would be suited and fitted. I could examine neck and arms and make a pretty good guess at color, size, and zoom length before confirming with tape measure. After my father's death in 1962, I sold the business and became a photographer. The outspeeding skills have rusted, but that awareness of the body, of its proportion, size, and build, and of what is declared in stance clothing and ornamentation has become sharper and broader. So I'm obviously very interested in, uh, in the idea that uh, Dave Goldblatt had this uh, feeling of the bulges, which I'm sure many of us can relate to. When he was in kindergarten, we're talking about circa 1934, 1935, he was born in 1930, and this picture is from a serious time in 1975. So it's 45 years later, Basically, this is a, a live effort. And uh, that's really what I want to underline, what we have here today for artists whose life effort uh, is uh, their work and their practice. We will see a little bit of what they've done, because obviously this is a short panel, uh, but we are very excited to have them here. They are uh, dear friends, colleagues, and people that we, uh, whose work we love. I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction to uh, who they are. Um, okay, in order of appearance, Evie Day is a sculptor. I'm not going to say anything about academic uh, collections, museums, exhibition, awards. They're super qualified. You can look in their bio. <laughs> GSAP website, we're going fast on Google. <laughs> this is like beyond the organic food, there is the post-organic, that's where we are. We don't need to say anything <laughs> So Evie Day is a sculptor whose work uh, is very much about suspension, uh, is uh, defined gravity through suspension, fabric, lines, uh, and is very much in relationship to architecture, but also to sexuality, being a woman, and humor, and humor. Uh, Mark Ganslas is uh, also an artist uh, whose work instead explores the connection between uh, material practice in art, science, and industry. Uh, he's also an amazing maker, and I need to say that from direct experience. We have worked with him a few times. Mark uses video photography, print, publishing, and object making to enter in dialogue with uh, laboratories, factories, and institutions, and collaborates with scientists and artists. Sarah Oppenheimer is uh, an artist whose work extends the boundaries between sculpture and architecture. Her manipulation of standardized spaces disrupt the experience of spatial continuity and in that he reorients and clarifies the experience of the built environment. <laughs> Alan Wexler, last but not least, uh, Alan Wexler's work is between architectural design and art. 
uh, altering perception of domestic activities. This for me is very interesting, especially in thinking about the idea of staying with something that is very close, and I really hope that you look at that. Uh, Alan's work investigates eating, bathing, sitting, and socializing, turning this everyday moment into theater and ritual. So we asked these artists to um, respond to two prompts. The first one was, why the material? Why the material they are using? And in doing that, we are also hoping to dig a little bit into their personal something. And then the second one is just, we ask them to show two projects. Uh, and for us, the idea of showing two is to show an effort in uh, how each one of them state and stakes their words, states their actions, state their voice, their personal voice. So we hope that uh, the first half is going to be uh, that presenting, the second half is going to be a conversation. We hope that the makers in this room will make us hear their voices and participate in the conversation actively. I really trust that their work and the proximity of their work will generate some interesting sparks for a good discussion. Hello, and thank you so much for having me here with all of you at Columbia and um, in the architecture program. It's not an architect by any means, by any stretch, but um, my work I have, you'll see there's a dialogue there, and I love talking about work here. Um, and also, this topic is so fantastic because I was talking to other panelists here today who have great work, and that, um, you know, this is the part, this discussion, this conversation is something that curators don't write about, critics don't write about. Um, you only really know from your peers or, you know, that come to your studio because this part isn't really. This is the meat of what we do, is the making of something, which way or another. And thinking and making, I like the idea of it sounds like making is messy, like getting your hands dirty and you met. But we all think a lot, but you have to make something, and whether it's in the computer or otherwise. Um, so it just has a very, just very gener just generosity to this, this idea. And um, so I have two projects. This is uh, one called Bride Fight. Um, and what you're looking at is, um, this is situated at uh, the Beaver House here in New York on Park Avenue, so it's a semi-public piece. And what it is, is two bridal gowns. Um, they're real scale princess gowns. And um, I'm just going to describe this as, there's three ingredients, primary ingredients to it, which is the bridal gowns and the accessories, hair and shoes and gloves. And then um, there's hardware, oversized hardware. Um, we're intentionally oversized. We've got turnbuckles and eye hooks and um, huge washers. And you have very the largest test monofilament you can get, 400 pound test monofilament. And all of these uh, materials are designed to withstand um, you know, the sun and the salty sea. So they're very. They, they are more than what is needed to suspend a dress, let's say. Um, and with that, the third and most important ingredient is really attention. And I say that because, um, well, here are these gowns, I'll go back for a second. It's just that the tension here, for the piece that you know, we're looking at, if I could take the strings away and I could just have it floating like this, I have no interest in that. And um, when I'm Think about that when I'm like, well, are there too many lines? Is there enough lines? Uh, it's really about drawing into, into the space and using this monocle, which is translucent, but it's really heavy, so you really see it. And it is kind of an extension of the drawing and the trajectory. It's kind of a stop action. Um, there's a lot of things I could talk about the piece, but I just, the materials are the concept. The materials are the content. The material, like a wedding, these wedding gowns, there's two of them, there's a narrative there. It's not about a, a person or a bride, it's sort of about this culture. And then suspending it for, I mean, it was rather literal in a certain sense, but I got there through many, many, many pieces before I realized this piece, by the way. This wasn't just like a one-off. This was sort of a culmination of many pieces. But um, the tension is, is 
a real ingredient to the work, and without it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, here's just briefly, so you can just see like these gowns, they're vintage, they were worn, they're so huge they could stand up on their own, which is why I did the piece, I saw them, and in a consignment, and they're literally, they're so huge that they're opera costumes, essentially, they're built in exactly the same way, and I did have some experience with opera costumes, and um, they're constructed, and you know, it's like they're constructed and built to be like uh, the driverless car. So like the bride, all they have to do is step in, and it's like everyone knows who you are, what your role is, you don't have to say anything, and you are bigger than everyone else, and it's your day. It's your one day. You get, you know, traditionally this idea, this narrative. So there you are, and it's doing it for you. And so I, but anyway, so, and then um, I worked up with a model. These are Barbie bridal gowns. And um, I have a grid above and below. And in my studio at home, I have a grid above and the floor I can screw into. But then I make a grid. And this is how I sort of work out the trajectory of how many lines. And of course, it changes in life, but it's not, it, it, it works pretty well um, having a grid and um, also sort of the force and tension with something like a regular grid, I find. Um, it just enhances this idea of like you're pulling things apart in a chaotic kind of way. Um, and there's another close up. And here's working in the studio. So you can see the ceiling a little bit there, it's grid. And, um, but this making, so I'm getting to play both ways and learning about tension. And so you could basically remove the dresses and you would have a tensile sculpture standing there. It is, it is its own skeleton. It is, it is a sculpture, and this is on, but I don't build it. With, I have to build it together in conjunction. I have sort of an idea of where I want a fabric to be, but it's a slow process, and you know, you're constantly going around and around and around and trying to work, you know, work it out like this. Um, so I could, and someday maybe I'll be gutsy enough just take everything out and then see what it really looks like alone. I mean, maybe we can scan it or something. Um, and so yeah, here's just another view um, of this thing that I also, the idea of it being abstracted, where am I in time? I'm almost done with this piece. Okay. Um, is that um, I wanted to be able to recognize it. We all know what a wedding dress looks like and to sort of dissolve it to a certain extent so that you see it's changing. So, the critique is not so much, you know, wedding gowns and light is terrible, it's just that it's a dissolving culture, we see through it now, it's another way of you know, deciding the kind of celebration that you want to have. And um, so that's kind of where my critique lies, but it's also the materiality of all of the excess of the pearls and the hair. And the, the thing. So um, the second piece I'm going to talk about is not the glass house, but at the glass house, um, I was commissioned to do a project with one of the other buildings on his estate. So just as a frame of reference on his property in Canaan, he has several other pavilions. They all have a different, a different era. So the one that I worked on was this, mm -hmm. and it was known as Da Monsta, 1995. It's very 90s. And um, it was a really interesting challenge. So do whatever you want, they say. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'm responding to, in a way, is first it's titled Dumont stuff. So there's this implied narrative of, oh, it's a funny monster, or it's maybe it's a joke architecture because there are no right angles anywhere. Is that why it's a monster? It's a monster because, I don't know what he was thinking necessarily, except for that it's a very animated looking thing. And then the inside of it, it was built from a solid model. So the interior, they didn't have any plans for that whatsoever. So when you walk in here and there are no right angles, you, there's a flat floor. The floor is, I think, is level. But everything else is curving and the, the ceiling is bowing and it's straight and curved. And it's, people get a little bit motion sick inside. And um, so with that and my interest in tension and control, here I'm trying to figure out what to do, um, you can see the ceiling, I mean, that's of that scale, so I'm like five feet, and then there's maybe another five feet at that corner, and the ceiling's going this way. Um, so um, I'm thinking about Demonsta, and I'm thinking about what, um, okay, you can see scale on the outside again. Um, 
and I'm thinking about tying it down because it's like <laughs> driving crazy. You know, like how do I, how do I kind of control it? And thinking about Demonsta and like what if there was an opponent to Demonsta? There was like some other like Louise Bourgeois spider out there, or you know, coming across the landscape. And um, I had previously worked with, uh, or and I continue to work with fishnet stockings as a kind of language that has to do with wireframe and structure in space and illusion of space, and also as um, it's doing its job when it's around a woman's leg, it's showing contours. And I like to use it in a way as a kind of idea of, of feminine and industrial building. And then Spider Man, I used um, in his costume, fishing line as his web, his net, and the idea is I love Spider Man, but you know, there's no spider woman that quite has the same feeling as this is Spidey striptease showing his feminine side. I thought that would be a way to sort of like bring, you know, a little more balance there with Spider-Man. So um, there's fishnet being involved there. And so through this, it gave me the idea, this is my proposal drawing, to um, maybe tether it down with this spider web. And then I thought, okay, well, what would I make it out of? Am I going to knit that? Am I going to you know, use my hands, is it handmade, is it fabricated? Because all of those things are going to make such a difference with handmade. I'm like, handmade is not going to do it in this. Like, it's not, you know, I, I, it needed to be outdoor, and I needed, but I needed to just have an industrial feeling. And so um, I found climbing ropes, and you can order them in different sizes. And um, so this was the, the, um, mission and um, and here is the tension. So you've got in this case you've got the rope and you've got the building I consider an ingredient in this the building is the other material and then you have tension and so then so we've really tied it down. Um, then it's uh, time to go inside again. Um, let me see uh, and the details so uh, um, so I'm back inside, and this is another complicated angle of, of the vertigo inducing <laughs> lack of structure, or not lack of geometry, really. So, um, so what I did was I followed all the contours with slotted angle steel, and um, in certain areas they're cut in many pieces just to, to go around the curves and, and then straight. And uh, I've been working with this material for quite a while, framing and uh, using it as a suspension um, framework for my work to make it portable or experiment. Um, and so I use the, these are elastic cords, and um, I found it uh, on the site in another one of the pavilions where they just use it as a stanchion. And so I said, can I borrow that? And um, so I'm sort of like, yeah, I think maybe if I just like course this thing, I just put cinch it in, but I got it from the top. And now maybe this is a way I can think about um, like reining in the chaos through imposing some geometry and um, some kind of vortex and some kind of perspective in it. Um, and this is then the other angle. And you still have plenty of chaos and shadows. And it's difficult to see the ceiling here is it's going down like a st overhanging stump. And there is one more um, element here, which is yes, so I put a, um, a giant speaker underneath the floor on um, down which is wood. And it's my cat purring. Um, um, so just adding to the ambiguity of the monster, is it a monster? Or, is it happy or if you're inside? Then that's detail. And this is a, a 360 photo, you know, with the iPhone. Um, to talk about it, and it's still like, and then, and then what I did was I built a model later because now there were no plans, so um, I still, you know, could never get a total grip on it. So I took an erector set, and now, now I could, I measured everything. It was much easier, and. Um, and so now I have this thing, I've thought about then taking it somewhere else and using it as a scale model to build without walls or you know, just this odd shape of working with it in that way. And you get a sort of like pulling the seams out of this mysterious volume. So I think I'm yeah. that's it. <laughs> Uh, 
Thank you very much for having me. This is really a cool opportunity. Um, here's this corner. So uh, I, I work across disciplines. I guess I'm an emissary here for, for metal in some ways. But um, I guess I, I, at the outset, I'd like to just say that metal work, specifically with steel, has, it, it informs my work, right? Whether I'm using it or not. And by that I mean that in, in a lot of my work, and this is not my work per se, but um, in a lot of my work, there's like an underlying material facticity. There's some kind of baseline that goes back to the structure of materials. And I think that that is about contending with scale and the scale between the world we think we live in and the world as, as, it, as it is. And when you're working with the technical material, of which metal and steel in particular is, um, it allows you to engage the world in a one-to-one -one relationship, especially when you're working with industry or science, um, where I find myself sometimes. Um, so through intermediaries, through kind of mundane objects, you get to enter into these larger flows of economy and, and society. So this is from a, uh, a residency that I, I did at Culver in 2006. So I'm showing two projects about 10 years apart. And, <clears throat> okay, so Kohler, right, everyone know about Kohler, they make toilets, sinks, bathtubs, faucets, uh, industrial castings, generators, all kinds of stuff. They're based in Sheboygan or in Kohler, Wisconsin, which is near Sheboygan, Wisconsin, uh, but they produce all over the world. They produce in Mexico, China, but their flagship factory is in uh, Kohler, Wisconsin, which is a one-horse town. It's a factory town. It's the site of one of the worst labor disputes in American history, right? Um, in 1937, 1934, uh, and then again in 1954, there were very violent strikes. Um, Mr. Kohler showed up with a shotgun to break the strike at one point. So um, what I was interested in, so in the 70s they had an artist residency program, right? Um, along with corn and glass, a bunch of different industries. Um, had, had spaces for artists in their factories. And um, so Kohler has this, this opportunity for artists to come in and work, either in the ceramics department where they do a lot of slip casting, or in iron and brass foundries where they do um, bathtubs, sinks, and uh, faucets. So this is the factory when I was there. Right? There were 5,000 people working 24 seven, right? So three shifts uh, every day. And it's still the dark satanic mills, right? It's one of the best factories uh, in terms of hygiene, but it's, it's serious. It's, people are dying slowly from the work that they're doing. So I, my studio was in between um, where they did the finish grinding on bathtubs and on the cast iron basins and uh, kind of like storage. And uh, at, at lunch break, you know, people would be like kind of splayed out in the, uh, in the break room. And some of the people that were doing the grinding were getting carpal tunnel, uh, you know, like their, their tendons scattered out from carpal tunnel syndrome and things like that. So it's heavy industry. This is um, uh, the scrap pile in the back after iron casting. That's a glowing pile of, of uh, pigs and ingots after they're cast. The scrap stream uh, is coming from all over the world, mostly China and India. And what's happening is America and uh, other parts of the world have different standards for raw materials, right? Or, or for cast iron, especially when it gets into uh, food-based appliances and things like that. So scrap gets bought from America, goes to China or India, gets reprocessed into new objects, sent back here, becomes scrap again, and places like Kohler buy it, and then have to kind of recalibrate the scrap, right? Uh, for American made goods at this flagship factory. The factory is 100 years old. So they, they, they consume as much electricity as Milwaukee, right? They've got three 70 ton furnaces running 24 hours a day. So this is one of the furnaces. It goes about 40 feet down, and that's the top of the furnace, right? So I was thinking about how to, how to work with a factory at large, right? Not to go in there and make one object or a cast iron thing or a brass thing or a ceramic thing, but how to collaborate with the whole factory. And uh, what I was saying about was if, if you follow the raw material, you'll meet everyone, right? So the iron comes off the train to the scrap processing, 
goes through the furnaces, goes through the production line, comes out with other science finished products. If I follow that, um, I'll, I'll get to collaborate with as many people as possible. So how do you follow cast iron? Um, at the same time, I was researching uh, meteorites. Just iron meteorites are basically uh, the same as the center of the Earth. We're going to be an iron meteorite at some point. Um, they are indifferent to humans, right? They're out in space. And then uh, a meteorite is a social object, right? So this idea of scale, right? Iron is indifferent. Steel is a social material. It's made for us. So meteorites are cruising around in space. And then in a very short period of time, they become social objects when we witness them. Right. So this is a painting of a meteorite landing in uh, Siberia in 1947. It's called the Seiko Atom Meteorite. Um, it, be it became a pop culture event. There were songs about it. It's a postage stamp. Everyone knew about it. It was a couple thousand pounds. Um, and it landed in, uh, in, in a sparse part of the country, but enough people saw it. Right. So it's indifferent, and then it becomes social. Uh, so meteorites, because they fly around in space, pick up a lot of radiation, or some radiation. So they have a signature. They have a certain chemistry, and they also have a certain radioactive signature. The chemistry has a lot of nickel in it, uh, and then there's this kind of baseline radioactive level. Here they are finding a chunk of super down meteorite. It's, there's tons of it. You can buy it on eBay or at rock shows or something. Right? Um, Here's, here's one of the pieces I bought. Right? So I was thinking, OK, here's iron that, that has a signature. And here's, whatever, 210 tons of iron that pass through the, the factory every day. Can I get a little bit of this into their production line without losing that signature? And then use it like dye in a watershed, like in a stream? Right? Can I follow a radioactive piece of iron through a fat? So I worked with their engineers. and. and tried to do some tests on chemistry and how to have a particle not dissolve in molten iron. Here I am uh, throwing a small meteorite into the massive kind of melt furnace. That's not how it actually happened, but that was kind of a gesture. <laughs> how it actually happened, All right? So now I'll show you the of how it actually happened. So this is what I make. And this isn't my work, really. It's, it's a water fountain that they have been producing for 100 years, um, since the 20s, I guess. And uh, mostly for public schools and prisons. Um, and underneath the white enamel is cast iron, right? And it's, it's fantastic. So I, I picked this object. Let's include a meteorite in this object. OK, so the way you actually do it is you, you grind up the meteorite into a large amount of particles and then put them into the sand molds, right? So here are the sand molds on the production line. We put the, the molds for the furnace, or the master molds for the furnace, right? Here are the master molds. They used to push into sand, resin bonded sand, to make the, the molds that go into production. I, I put a tag in there that says Seco Allen because if they're banging out a thousand of these um, fountains, I, I need to be able to identify which ones. I only did 18 of these. So which ones actually have meteorites in it? Um, so then talk to the, to the technicians, engineers, chemists to figure out where in the mold to put these things so that they would kind of freeze. I want to be able to see particles inside this thing. All right, so here I am putting meteorite dust into, into the molds. There it is. You close the molds, you pour the iron, and then it goes through the whole thing. And it's basically, it's not a hands-off process, but it's fast and uh, serious. So I, I, I wasn't hand, this was not um, an art foundry. This was a production line. So there's automatic shakeout where the molds get broken apart, and then it goes to this basement conveyor. Uh, and this is, you know, there's no way to do this cleanly. It's, there's so much silica in there, it's, it's insane. Um, but out the other side comes the cast iron basins, right? And then they go to enameling. I don't have any pictures of enameling, but it's, it's beautiful. They sift um, powdered glass onto the, the molten uh, or they heat up the, uh, the basin and then sift powdered glass onto it. And the sifting, the, the way the enamel falls, always has to be perpendicular to the surface. So there are these incredibly skilled people that sift the, the, mold, the powdered glass. And it's, it's a dance, right? They're trying to keep the surface of the sifter 
for the, the flow of the, the glass and the basin perpendicular to each other. Two minutes. I, okay. Sorry. Okay. So uh, in a thousand years, if you cut one of these in half and, mm -hmm. and look at a uh, microscopic image or uh, the grain, um, you can see these particles in the meteorite. We did tests to see if there was failure. We did electron microscope images. Here's the uh, high mineral content meteoric iron inside the matrix of cast iron. Two minutes. Okay. This is Bob Halfman. He works in the brass foundry. He's been there 25 years. He was in his backyard and a meteorite fell. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> a copper meteorite. Right? There's no chances of getting hit by a meteorite. There's no odds. Right? But um, there are no copper meteorites. So it's a piece of man-made material, space junk, that landed in his backyard. And he walked over and picked it up. So that's all right. I'm not doing the next project super quickly. This is what, a meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> and it hits a car, and it's taking one. Right? Pete's still New York, and it hit it hit its <laughs> So the, the next project uh, is uh, this is not my, this is the gates of Versailles. I'm going to do this project in one minute. Okay. Uh, this is the gates of Versailles. Um, I, I was looking at the gates and fences as datums, right? Like a, a line from which you can observe the situation. The gate is never a subject, it's the boundary to the subject. Versailles is the subject. The gate just marks the line from which we observe the subject. This is a gallery I was showing at in Paris, in an old carriage house. Um, right outside is a, I don't know, um, right outside is this back staircase, the service staircase. And uh, there's this railing. And it's early Baroque, 1650s. Right? And I was thinking about I was thinking about labor and debt and uh, patronage in, in our world and how skills are transferable, right? So whoever had this commission for an aristocracy in, in 1650 might have been in a relationship akin to being an artist now, in terms of class division, in terms of skill and, and how we attribute skilled labor. Um, so uh, I decided to remake this railing, and this is the one that I made. So I, I, I trained as a blacksmith a long time ago, and I, had, I was shooting a lot of video before this, and uh, I just wanted to see if I could still use those, you know, somehow reactivate those skills to, to deal with something that I was concerned with at the time. I did a full scale drawing. This is just based off those two snapshots, right, those photographs of the railing. And this is like years after I took those photos. So start making scrolls, start making the frame. There were, I think, 17 or something different scroll tools. These are the master tools that used for making the individual scrolls. Right? And then just start fitting it. And whoever made this railing in Paris in 1650, you know, a railing that's been through all these through revolutions and world wars, had to do a very similar type of negotiation this adjustment of scrolls to fill a grid, right? They might have done it on site. They probably did it part on, on, in their shop and part on site. So there's all this tweaking that has to happen. So it took me about a month to make. Um, and the whole time I'm just thinking about, you know, just thinking about my hourly wage. Who's going to end up with this thing? What, what is this artifact? And that's the finish. And it, it's, it's okay. It's, it's like for blacksmithing, it's not, it's, there's a lot of problems. But I, I did the best I could. And so this informs, this works, right? So this is the print. This is the final work, or the most recent work. And this is just some uh, offset prints that I, that I made last year, two years ago. And it's just my house in Brooklyn, our apartment, and the neighbor's house, the landlord's house. So yeah, that's, that's how steel print is. Informed through. That's, that's it. That was really uh, a very interesting place to jump off on because I am thinking a lot about boundaries in different ways, I think, but also in related ways. And I just want to just say this is like an extraordinary combination of people. I was really, really excited to be. 
here with you guys. So thank you for, thank you. Uh, so anyway, um, in general, my work is engaged with the problem of the division of space. And at its baseline, there is a presumption that space is divided. And that the thickness of a building's boundaries perform a kind of mechanical and temporal labor. I'm interested in considering what happens when this thickness becomes visible, and what if the boundaries volume is emphasized rather than obscured, and opened rather than sealed. So that the boundary itself becomes the volume of space or the volume or location where the investigation occurs. The insulated glass unit, a sealed sandwich of glass and gas, is a common material in building facades. Simultaneously, a window and a wall, the IGU's glass-filled void performs mechanical work. It acts as insulation by controlling the passage of light and heat through the boundary plane. The IGU exemplifies the mechanical temporality of the architectural boundary. Daylight penetrates its surface. It expands and contracts both the materials within it, but also the construction joinery which it is connected to. When it comes to a building in motion, actually, one moment, I'm not quite done here. Um, I'm a bit confused for a second. So the project I'm going to speak about today is a project that, rather than um, break it into two projects, I've, I've decided to think about this project in, in perhaps two different veins. One being how it materially coalesces, and the other, and I would say inextricably, being how the project has a, um, performs a specific labor, and that is a kind of mechanical work. What is the mechanical work of this element as a temporal body? The piece, S337473, recently completed at the Wexner Center for the Arts, explores the interrelated mechanical and material functionality of the IGU. When it comes to a building in motion, drafting conventions are largely limited to the representation of a pivoting door. The door, turning of a door is drawn as an arc in plan. This arc represents the total possible positions of a door, the door at all times. 360 degree rotation extends the arc into a circle when the trace of this movement is viewed in elevation or at eye level the circular path appears at a line three years ago the studio began to play with shifting the orientation of this rotational axis the geometry of the glass volume in this early mechanized prototype is based on the igu Two layers of glass are separated by two aluminum bars. A volume of air is sandwiched between glass planes. The prototypes scaled up. In this case, two boxes um, were assembled and mounted on first in the studio, kind of um, off the shelf tubing, steel tubing, and later, um, on a more refined or at least more considered support structure. By orienting the axis of 45 degrees, the rectangular element rotates from vertical to horizontal. This reorientation of the axis of rotation also transforms the apparent path of motion from a circle to an ellipse in both elevation and plan. The representational convention of multiple viewing planes naturalized in the four viewports of computer-aided drafting systems, and here I would say, in terms of tools, that is a, a primary tool in terms of 
the way that I am generating work and interfacing with fabricators and other consultants as, as time goes on. Um, it became an essential conceptual guide and methodological tool in the development of the work. The point of view in a representational system became inextricably linked to the point of viewing in processional space. The orientation of the objects and the position of the bodies rel developed relationally. The studio developed a script to explore this problem parametrically. Here, the dimensions of a rotating element are numerically defined. The path of rotation automatically updates as the geometry is modified. The, ro the rotating element can be reoriented along the x, y, or z axis. Reorientation realigns the rotating object with the model's world coordinate system and thereby changes its relationship to both the axis of rotation and the viewing plane. Collision during rotation is marked and positional change is traced as volumetric form. Rotation is enabled by a kinetic detail, here shown in section through the axial center line. Not only does the glass geometry rotate around the central axis, but each internal kinetic component also rotates around this axis. S337473 at the Wexner Center for the Arts transforms the IGU. are positioned at 45 degrees to the primary axis of procession. Each switch bridges and marks the passable space. They're first encountered as the, by the visitors they process upwards towards the entry of the gallery space. S337473 also rotates along a 45 degree axis in elevation. Rotation around this axis transforms a lintel into a column and back again. In an ideal world, the glass element will have a constant velocity throughout the full arc of rotation. It will move smoothly. The digital model presents the work in an ideal state. Any imbalance due to material specificity or sighting creates irregularity in motion and results in significant changes in acceleration and velocity. Here we have a picture or a, video, a short video of an accelerometer that was attached to um, a working model by the Ohio State University's Department of Mechanical Engineering. And here they are looking at irregular weight distribution across the axis of rotation. The ideal model demonstrates constant speed throughout a 360 degree rotation, but the empirical model imbalance across the rotational axis creates eccentricities in motion. We attempted to um, think about how this equilibrium might be calibrated materially, how in fact we could compensate for the digital error that was occurring, or the digital perfection perhaps that was occurring, and the material error or disequilibrium in, in the actual physical object. And we used grasshopper script or extended our grasshopper script to allow us to think about how we might counterweight this imbalance in the actual physical thing. But what was required in the end was something much more, much more immediate, I would say. And that is that within these large volumes, uh, there were a set of cavities between, between the inner and outer skin. And we took bars of steel and basically attached it to this aluminum extrusion on the interior to offset some of the weightedness. And what that did in the end is it allowed us to not 
perfectly balance these elements because, and just so you know, these are manually, um, these are manually adjusted. But in fact, to materially modify them so that they would land in a horizontal position. So this is their state of rest. The glass was engineered to resist a multiplicity of forces. And one of the things I think that's materially notable about glass is that, in fact, glass, there's much, there's much to be said about glass that is a not Many materials that go into glass production that are not visible within that glass production are not thought about. So here we have a picture um, from the clean room where these pieces were assembled at a fa factory by the name of Agnora outside of Toronto, um, where a rigid SG interlayer was laminated between the two lights. And here, this is, a, this is a photograph of that process. The fabricator wanted to um, speak to us about the strength of that particular interlayer and had one of their employees demonstrate its resilience by actually shattering an erroneous piece of glass. The narrow profile of the glass created tremendous stress between the upper and lower bars. Here we see an analysis of the connection between the glass and the structural support. And here we see jigs that I developed in tandem with the, with the fabricator, which would allow us to place the, the metal supports which were mounted to the glazing in a perfect alignment so as to avoid stress across that rotational axis. In order to mount them with SG interlayer initially, um, it required that the glass and stainless steel bars enter the autoclave simultaneously. But when they pulled the bars out of the autoclave, in fact, we had a kind of major problem. And we were on a very tight exhibition schedule. So we, we were, in fact, a week away from the install when this occurred. And these, what happened was the expansion coefficient of the stainless steel bars did not match that of the glass. And the SG interlayer um, did not, in fact, have the flexibility, because it was so rigid, to absorb that air, error. So they came out of the autoclave um, basically like structural bananas. <laughs> and what we ended up doing was using a far more conventional IGU preparation method, which is structural silicone, to mount these stainless steel bars onto the element. The axial discontinuity between the two kinetic, the upper and lower kinetic detail, became incredibly important in thinking about the possibility both of equilibrium and of material analysis. At times, this discontinuity appeared opaque, at others transparent. The transparency, of course, is determined by the position of glass, the position of the sun, and in this case, the position of the camera. And that's it. Fantastic panel. I'm so honored to be here. Um, a, a little bit about my background. I'm trained as an architect. Um, and, and sometimes I go to cocktail parties and people ask me, what do I do for a living? And sometimes I say, I'm an architect. And, I'll, and then some will say, oh, do you do houses or residential? Well, I'm not really an architect, I'm an artist. And every time I went to cocktail parties, I'd be flustered, and my wife got really angry at me. So one <laughs> evening, I came back from a cocktail party and sat down, and I wrote down 20 responses to the question, Alan Wexler, what do you do for a living? And I, I made, printed them as calling cards, and I put them in my wallet, so when that question arises, I can answer them a little bit more clearly. So I'll read you one sample. <laughs> Alan Wexler, cocktail party response number 14. What kind of work do you do? I'm an architect in an artist's body. My studio is a laboratory. I sculpt with gravity and heat. I paint with rain. I use every day in ordinary activities, eating, sleeping, and bathing as media. I investigate the built environment archaeologically. 
My work looks at simple things. The sight line between two people sitting across from each other at a table, the many positions of two bricks in relationship to each other, how floor meets wall. My work defines habitable space and the wall that separates inside from outside. I invent ways to walk through walls. So I'm only going to show you, well, maybe two projects, but in, I can't read the date, I think in... 1990. 1990, I did this project called Chair a Day. And for 16 days, each day I made a chair. I would limit the time. In the morning I would decide, today I think I'll use my Bosch jigsaw. The next day I would use my table saw. Sometimes I would use a hand saw sometimes a chisel. Um, I'd start in the morning and then by the end of the day finish a chair and I did this for 16 days. So as an example, the, the, uh, the chair on the left um, is called Broken Plywood Chair. I've renamed it in memory of Alvaralto. It used to be Charles Ray Ames. I realized that's, anyway, long story, eight hours. I wanted to take a sheet of plywood and gently drape it over an orthogonal frame. So what I did is, this is on the North Fork of Long Island where I've had a, a studio. Um, I took a sheet of quarter inch plywood, put it in plastic, uh, wrapped it in uh, a drop cloth plastic polyethylene, poly polyethylene, put moisture inside, let it bake in the hot sun for seven hours while I'm building the frame. And seven hours, I take it out of the bag I try to drape it over the frame, of course it doesn't work. So I take the plywood and I strategically place bricks under the plywood and I drove my car over it. <laughs> the, one on the, the next one on the right, that one, is uh, a very bad mortise and tenon job. A mortise and tenon, square peg in a square hole. So my chiseling skills were not very strong at that time. I've gotten better over it as I get older. Um, and of course, the chair wobbled like hell, so I had to add a lot of wedges to reinforce the chair. But sometimes I think part of our work as craftspeople and makers, um, I like that phrase, thinkering, that was used in an essay, in a recent essay in, my, in a book on my work, uh, thinkering, which is actually, I discovered, not invented by a research scientist at Xerox Park, nor was Paolo Antonelli, who used that phrase in 2002, but was actually invented by Michael Andante in The English Patient, which coincidentally I'm reading like two days ago, and I come upon the phrase thinkering. It's the combination of thinking and making simultaneously. And I think we all do that. Um, and so um, just be wary of good craftsmanship. We get so, sometimes so good and skilled that the craft gets in the way of content. So I'm going to move to this. This is about um, 2000. Is that a date? Uh, anyway, two, it's about um, four or five years ago. So many years, about thir over 30 years, I'd say, what would happen if today, um, 30 years after doing Chair a Day, I do a project which is Chair a Day, you know, 2012. It would be a very different series of 16 chairs, but I went to an Ikea and they had a super sale of their Stefan chair and I filled up my car with flat pack Stefan chairs. I came back to my studio and I made an axonometric drawing of a Stefan chair and I made 100 Xeroxes of that chair. So this in terms of material, I think I'm stressing in this particular talk wood but also, in this case, Xerox. It's something that I've returned to many years. In fact, I was talking to Sarah about a project they did a long time ago at the Mattress Factory. And to generate ideas for the Mattress Factory, I took the floor plan, I made hundreds of Xeroxes, and I started transforming the Xeroxes. I didn't think of this as an actual chair. All I cared about was the two-dimensional surface. The carbon on that two-dimensional surface is a pure abstraction. I could violate it, I could manipulate it, I could twist it, I could turn it, I could take an X-Acto blade, I can cut it apart, I can rearrange the parts, I can take Prismacolor pencils and draw into it, I can um, you know, do all kinds of operations to these Xeroxes 
of a drawing of a Stefan chair. So I forgot the name of the thing one sees, as we know from Robert Irwin's, not Robert Irwin, I don't know, anyway. Um, so then if I go look more closely, um, I'm just zooming in on a few of the, of the Xerox transformations. And I said, wait a minute, maybe in fact those are proposals for the transformation of an Ikea Stefan chair. So I, I, I zoomed in on a few of these as examples. So um, for instance, you know, here's a chair where I'm extending the, um, the, the, um, the uh, elements of the chair into space infinitely. Um, and the, um, you know, this one, I took a piece of yellow buff tracing paper um, uh, and I cut it and I glued it on top of the chair. This one, I took the stencil from another page and I took some Prylon spray paint and sprayed it and then shifted it. And this one was the last one in that series. Uh, I took an Elmer's glue, glued it over the drawing of the axonometric of the chair, swept my studio floor, and sprinkled the sweepings onto the chair itself. So this is the yellow drawing, the trace glued onto the chair. The interpretation of that chair is called 1 equals 2. So which is the real chair? Which is the real chair? The crate or the chair itself? Um, this chair, I did, I remember one of the drawings I did was an axonometric, I cut the things out, and I just took a pencil and connected the two backs of the chairs and cut off the legs. I tried to do that, it didn't work, so uh, this is my version of a love seat. So two people need to sit simultaneously in the chair to balance each other, otherwise the chair falls. <laughs> It's very easy in Photoshop or with an X-Acto knife to separate the elements of the chair into back to a kind of flat pack version to the elements of the IKEA chair, which is flat pack. And then, so I, so I interpreted it as one interpretation. I could probably have done 16 variations on isolating the elements of the chair. This is only one solution. Oops, I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, this is only one version, just using threaded rod and, um, and nuts to separate and uh, make the elements of the chair appear to float in relation to each other. Um, I had gotten at a flea market, I do a lot of flea marketing and yard sailing, and a lot of these things enter my studio, and later on in my work, 30 years later, it might be, oh, I bring something out, I look at it differently because I'm working on a project, and it becomes part of my work. So there was a uh, a, a dress form that was expandable. So you could take a dress, a, a woman's body that was very petite, and by sliding elements of the body apart from each other, you can make a larger person. So I took the elements of that, and I kind of riffed on that, and made a chair that allows it to expand and grow with side. Um, um, this is a, a, a two chairs together, I think I call it interchange. It's interesting when you're making something, because the making comes for me, the making comes first. They don't premeditate. I have two chairs in my studio, and I say, what would happen if I made the four legs connected together um, continuously? And so the, um, and then I realized after I finished this project, what it means. I, I painted this chair, Benjamin Moore, interior grade, semi-gloss, china white. This is Benjamin Moore, interior gray, semi-gloss, Navajo white. So I didn't realize when I was doing this project the political implications of this chair. But all the work we do has, you know, conveys meaning. Sometimes the meaning happens in advance. Sometimes it happens after the fact. And then it might lead to another project. And I think that's the art of making. This is called body language. Um, so the, the um, I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, I love this laser pencil, cool. Um, so in the legs of the chair, I put pencils. And you know when you sit in a chair and you're sitting around a dinner table and you're moving your chair, you kind of lift up a little bit and move it forward to get comfortable. And you're having a conversation around a table. And as you have a conversation around a table, it's making a drawing on the floor. It's basically scratching the floor, uh, especially if you don't have little foam pads underneath. So I was exploiting that problem 
and turning it into something that's a positive. So the scratching of a floor, which marks time, we talk about it in architecture and design positively as patina and age and things aging with beauty, you know, wrinkling and so on. It's a beautiful thing. So here, the um, pencil legs make a drawing, but then the problem is when you sit on that chair, the pencil points break. So very simply, there's a drill a hole in the leg and then there's a little spring. So as you sit down, the chair, the pencil is retracted into the leg. This is, um, I took the Ikea chair and I burned it. A piece of charcoal breaks off the chair and the charcoal is then used to make an axonometric drawing. <laughs> I, I have two degrees in architecture and I couldn't draw very well, but axonometrics I could do. I couldn't draw people, so chairs became a stand-in for the way I rendered human activity or human interaction. We project ourselves into that thing, and we become the chair. And the chair is anthropomorphic in that sense. This is called selflessness. So in this case, I take one chair and I, I sacrifice a piece of the chair for the sake of my guest. I've, um, and I raise the chair that my guest to be more important than me. And then the next one is selfless, selfishness, which is where I sacrifice the chair to raise myself higher than the rest of the individuals sitting around the table. Um, simple transformation of the seat to become one continuous bench. Detail. Um, the crate, for me, your crate artwork, sometimes the crate is so much more beautiful than the content of the crate. That's scary. That happens. I've done some project called Crate House, where the crate became rooms of a house. Uh, this is another version of the crate house done with the chair. And then here is um, an idea of precision and imprecision. So I took my Bosch jigsaw, and I love tools, I collect tools. I took a Bosch jigsaw and I cut the corner away really fast, without hesitation, without thinking about it. This one, I took this, this chair and I tried to fit it into this chair. Then I had to do it very slowly and meticulous, and I still didn't do such a good job. You can see the gapping here, and I tried to get it as precisely as I can, but, but one is very fast and one is very slow. And I like that dialectic between precision, imprecision, and so on. And, fat and speed. This is my version of Riefeld's blue red chair, um, red blue chair. Um, I think mine is a little better um, <laughs> because mine, the force is the vector diagram of a, a body sitting in space. Um, the forces pass through each other because mathematically there's no such thing as over, with Riefeld's overlap each other, mine pass through each other. Um, and, um, that's a self portrait. It's the amount of weight, that's my body weight in concrete bricks. You see it's floating three quarters of an inch off the ground. Not too much, just a little bit. You know, the Japanese tea room is only one stepping stone above the, above the profane earth. And yet it's a spiritual space. You don't need to make tall buildings to create spirituality or to lift yourself into the heavens. Three quarters of an inch is plenty. <laughs> yeah. A scaffold. Uh, the scaffold is a, is a material I've come back to over, over, my, over my career. Uh, it represents works in progress, potential, um, makes things flow. This is, one, this is called um, a table for the typical house. Um, it reminds me of Mies van der Rohe's Brick Country House, which I've always loved. And I've just taken X walls and extended them through the typical table. And there's one table, typical American family, four people sitting at the same table, sitting in separate rooms. <laughs> However, my table has one salt shaker, bottle of mustard, ketchup, and pepper. So there has to be some sense of communication in, within each of those rooms. Um, um, we don't, this is a floating, plain, don't look at all of this. Like in Bunraku puppetry, you don't see the puppeteer. Forget the scaffolding. All you see is the floating plane. And then a private institute. This is, um, I was asked to do a sculpture for the campus, which is still there. That's the version of that in stainless steel, I mean, in aluminum. And the last project, um, 
This is a project that uh, my wife and I did for the Hudson River Park called Two Two Large Tables. That's an aerial view of it. Um, it's at 29th Street along the Hudson River. And it's two, two horizontal planes. One plane is at table height over here. One table is at table height. One table's a plane is at roof height. Um, the problem with a table that's 16 feet is you can't really have a good conversation. So the problem creates a solution that is about innovation, which is that you cut slots in the table which allow people to enter the table from four different places, from four different directions, and form a community. And it becomes a kind of clothing. The chairs in each case are exactly the same as the chairs in each other. They're positioned exactly the same. In each case, they hold up the, the um, two horizontal planes. And the last one is my riff on the two two large tables done with the step on chair called two little two large tables. <laughs> and a little plug for a book that just came out of my work called Absurd Thinking Between Art and Design. So um, thank you. Um, first, again, thank you all for coming. I think it's like an incredible body of work cumulatively is way too big for us to talk about today. Um, so in as much as we strive as architects to be as crafty with immaterial things, space, reflection, feelings, um, as we are expert at crafting with wood, steel, glass, maybe you could talk a little bit about the connection between the material and the immaterial things in your work. I'll start with Sarah. So I think um, particularly in relation to the that I was speaking with, it was a a really extraordinary lesson in a new notion of materiality, and for new to me, um, which had to do with the possibility of equilibrium as a driving aesthetic condition, and as a sensible condition, meaning one could sense it materially without um, necessarily having a language for it. So it's easy in some ways to talk about quantitatively. It's easy to talk. It's even, it's even I would say, in many cases, to, easy to model things materially, digitally. I think um, a number of people talked about that. Mark really spoke, spoke to that. Um, but it's sensibleness, how one uh, senses it, in some ways moves outside of the condition of its, of its of its, not its materiality, it actually is its materiality, it is our engage, I guess I would say it is our present engagement with its materiality that is its immaterial condition, which is reflection, it's an optical, it's an optical relation describing a physical condition or achieving a physical condition. And, and I, I suppose one could actually say reflection is a material property, but that our, our experience of that is a bit more than something. Maybe I'd pass, um, maybe I'd then pass a slightly different version of the same um, question to Alan, especially in the context of talking about explicitly in architectural history, we talked about architects painting with light. Some of the sort of rhetorical language that you've used to describe your own work. So what can you say about your capacity to use the material things as the real things? Um, well, I think the, well, it's about how we work with materials and physical properties. But if we're good at what we do, you know, if we, you know, make materials transcendent so they convey psych psychological conditions or poetics or spirituality. I mean, how can we take, you know, a, a brick and make it into an ethereal, sublime material, the most basic? I, I'm right presently teaching interior design, and it's interesting, and I tell my students what I'm trying to teach you is alchemy. How can you take the most mundane materials like lead and turn them into gold? How can you take, if you're doing objects using cardboard or chipboard, how can they become incredibly valuable and meaningful and spiritual? 
So how can they transcend their materialness? And that's so the so I think even E.B. Day's, for instance, you talked about the the um, the the, um, the kind of flimsiness, not flimsy, but the flimsiness of fabric, the translucency of fabric, and that gets even more ethereal when you contrast it with with aircraft cable and turnbuckles and S hooks and you know and and nickel plated hardware. You know, I think that the contrast, and I think. You know, Louis Kahn, of course, talks about that a lot. Yeah. You know, how um, his work is really transcendent. I mean, you know, how can we do that? How does it convey meaning? In some of my work, it's it's not just meaning, but it's also humor. I, I mean, I potentially play up humor to some extent, because I think sometimes to break through preconceptions about the world, we need to be lighthearted. And that's a good entry point into more profound things, I hope, by entering with sense of humor. So I have one um, comment in, in what you're describing about this alchemical relation. And it has to do with the theme of the instruments and how when you have an instrument and you're tuning that instrument, you are in a dynamic with that material thing. And so you are sense you are responding if there's a kind of symbiotic response, a call and response that you have with what we may call material, we may call the immateriality or its collection of existence. And I think that that relation of tuning is part of the problem of making in certain ways. I um I want to turn a little bit the conversation um, from uh, the, from uh, starting from Ada's introduction today. Uh, a little bit the intention also be behind uh, this initiative today and also in the coming months and hopefully years in Colombia. Uh, you know, thinking by making is a topic here. And I would say also making as a discipline, making as an obsession, making as something that is painful and, and joyful and repeats itself. Um, and it's very clear that all of you are very obsessive in what you, in what you do. Uh, that you stick with almost minute, minute things that you know you keep repeating. You know, Evie was saying. This is not my first time at the rodeo, right? Stretching those, those, those two gowns. He's been there many times. And we all know, I mean, I know all your words very well, so I know how painfully you stay with you with your thing. So I, I would love for you guys to talk a little bit a little bit about that. However, however you see fit. What does it mean? What does it mean to stay with something? What does it mean to stay with something throughout your life? What does it mean to stay with something throughout your day? What does it mean to not sleep at night? Because you need to figure out how that thing doesn't break and, and how that movement. So it's, it's, it's a concept, you know, the, the reason again, not to be too polemic, but the reason why we are also pushing in this direction today in the school is to counter, not to annihilate, but to counter the facility of making shapes mm -hmm. and making shapes and making shapes and making shapes in a computer or however, and then you know show them on Instagram and, and, and basically that we make, that is the obsession there. It's the obsession of creating images, not even things, but images of things and images of images. Um, and you said the discipline that a lot of artists and definitely the four of you show is extremely uh, strong in that direction. So I would love for all of you guys to say something about that. Just say something. Um, it was Neil Young, right? Neil Young said, uh, it's all the same song. Right. That's <laughs> true. Right? It's all the same song. And, but it goes to the material thing also in that, I, I don't know about you all, but I, I mean, I've drawn so many lines in the sand and said, absolutely not that but this, and that's the thing that keeps you up at night. And the, the deeper you get into the material, the more you believe in the efficacy of the material, the more you can move into a space of speculation metaphor out of it, right? So I don't know anything about anything, but if I know a little bit about a little bit, 
I can draw a line in the sand and say, all right, you know, and put your credit card down on that, right? So there's this hedging against the complete guesswork of waking up and doing this tomorrow, right? And it's not hedging, but it's like the best bet is by really studying materials. I, at least that's how I think about it. I, I go back, you know, uh, what is necessity is the mother of invention is not true at all, right? Leisure is the mother of invention. When you need to do something, you go with what you know. So the more you know the material, the more you can fight something like that. So that's at least my <laughs> yeah, um, just to say something about time process is that, which, like, you couldn't do this. <laughs> I work with this flexible material, like, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off, like, and, 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 like, 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 in such a fast way, and I need to work that way, and I look at your work, and it's just like, imagining the focus of all the planning, every one of the steps to try, you know, it's just, Phenomenal. So that way, sticking with something is like hardcore, and I feel like I'm sticking with these materials um, because of because of, it's like I'm drawing in with the space and drawing around my body. Um, I think, and I can say like, oh, what if I took two dresses and exploded them? That would be funny, you know. Oh, it sounds terrible, you know. It's just all of my ideas sound terrible on paper, but I go through the process and um, keep pushing it and. and but it is, for me, it's this flexibility that remains, and then in the end, it's the honey and honey and honey, which you see in the final thing. It's like, okay, I've decided to use the lines I want. It's not right on the map at all. I mean, at all. If there's something slack in one of those things, I mean, I'm, I start to get sick. It's just um, because it's not the thing anymore. Like, I don't like people to see it being installed or taken apart, because when it's slack, it's nothing to do with what it is. And I feel I'm totally naked and bleeding or something. I just can't stand it. But um, I don't know where that takes you. But I'm, you know, I have such admiration for all of your work. And just to say that thing about my elastic movements, you know, and I feel like when I imagine your work so, I mean, I know that there's a lot of formulaic or mathematics and so forth going on. But it's like once you commit to that thing, it's like you went into the oven and then the you know, it didn't work because there's a slight variation after the cooking. But I have to say something, because I, about your comment about your own work, because it's interesting, I don't think I see your work that way at all, the way you're seeing it. <laughs> the thing that I, I am so observing in your work is how challenging the ground is. That the ground is this great, it's a great problem, and in a way, the ground becomes the, the unspoken counterpoint to the complexity of the non-ground. And so you have this really beautiful tension. It's the tension, but it's the tension of the anchor. And so you're like the grid, and then it was fascinating to see your studio, like how those points are starting to array on the ground, and what does that mean? It's like a kind of territorial map, the body, all these things. And, I, and so in some ways, for me, looking at your work, I see complex constraint, and it's a to, I need this ground. So, so to me, I'm not seeing. I'm, I guess it's really yeah, interesting. The, 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 the process, the actual, you know, final, like, that's it. But what I, I'm so glad also you brought that up because the other element there's tension and gravity, but there's really about punctuation. I always use this word about where you are in the space. It's about if that space is a generic space or it happens to be this strange old Johnson pavilion or whatever, it is a context to be considered more or less. And so for me, especially when I was using, um, I use a more a feminist bent on reality of these mundane things like wearing a dress or not wearing a dress, I, it's still a big issue. I mean, it's an everyday. And what you say about using humor as a way to get to the, the more complex feelings, I'm so grateful you said that. Because I struggle with how to describe humor and wanting to get further with this, this, this um, oversized hardware um, in the floor, the ceiling, is sort of to just say, like, it's a problem. And we're living with it. We walk around it. We can afford it. But it's, it's also there. a critical and feminist problem. Yeah. Right? yeah. Especially nowadays. So, um, so it you're speaks still here. to this climate, yeah. 
in a way. It's this sad. contrast between the kind of masculine and feminine as well. Because we it, the cliche of the masculine the cliche. feminine, the hardware versus yes. the software. Right. You know, the software, right. Right. not that software, but that software. Right. And that's sort of fabric um, versus um, stainless steel. There's an architecture friend of mine early on who said, don't use those terminals, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, no. And I was like, exactly, I'm so glad it bothers you. That's exactly <laughs> why it looks awkward, That's it really looks great. unnecessary. Absolutely. It's totally necessary because I'm trying to make the material be something different. And if you look at Victorian hoop skirts and whalebone constructions, they're not unlike the hardware <laughs> and world constructions. That's the things that are designed to defy gravity and to make things appear to flow in space and dematerialize and um, break apart. But I wanted to speak about um, this word obsession because I think it's a dangerous word actually um, because I don't think you would use that term if you were talking about a research scientist focusing a life's work looking at microscopic cellular structure, some phenomenon, you know, that their life in the studio, I meant the laboratory, we're much the same kind of people. I think it's not so much an obsession, it's rigor, it's, rigor. it's scholarship, it's invention, creativity, and it happens within science as well as within the art world. So I know it's a little pet peeve I have because a lot of artists use that term obsession to be obsessive, but that's really a bit of an illness. When you're in control, maybe, of obsession, it's kind of scholarship and rigorous. Uh, experimentation. Yeah. I mean, you, I use the word obsession as in, I know, as I know. in not letting go. Exactly. You know I, mean? you I know don't exactly what you mean. Go. But maybe we have to be a little careful because for some people who wear obsessive disorders are really not <laughs> 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 No, I think it's interesting, you know, what, what, what Evie, what you pointed out, right? I mean, the difference that you saw between the way that you work and Sarah works, and you know, in this four between the four of you, there is, you know, the more artisanal, the more handmade, definitely over there. The 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 made the made through tools that are bigger than you, bigger than your hands, and industrial and everything more over there. Although, you know, Mark actually showed two opposites: something that you steal, yeah. art, and that you have. Have, have um, you know, kind of um, um, molded or whatever it's called, uh, like in back in the 1600s, um, and instead sort of stealthily going into the production of color. But I think that that is an interesting thing because the idea of this obsession uh, that I'm talking about, or the idea of really caring about the making and the discovery, what you discover through making things, does not have anything to do with whether you make it yourself with a knife and a thing, or whether somebody else can make it for you, because that is a little bit of a myth of the difference between the artist and the architect, right? The artist is the one that sculpts with the chisel, and the architect does the drawing, and then somebody else builds it. Uh, but there is, you know, there shouldn't be any kind of careless gradation. So the, again. I guess wanting to be polemic, before I said not wanting to be polemic, not wanting to be polemic, the, the problem can be in architecture right now where you make a shape, then you give and then somebody else figures out how to make it and what and what it is. And ultimately really figuring out what it is, right? Because if you don't know how to make it, you really don't know what it is and what you're doing. So the idea well, of not enough for me no, I mean, I think that the exciting thing well, about the world, seeing your work the world is, that is, that opportunity, is, you know. is the opportunity <clears throat> that that the relationship, uh, however you think. Right. You know, it's very interesting. You were talking about, what did you say, uh, how you take a brick and you make it uh, becoming sublime, yes. right? Yes. And then yes. I'm thinking Challenge. about Mark's uh, uh, drinking fountain, right? Yeah. And then how you take something sublime, like a meteorite. You yeah. become this really banal, oh, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. it, you can go in any direction. Yeah, you can go in any yeah. direction. Yeah. And there's something sublime at the end of drinking from a fountain yeah. that you take this meteorite, right? Yeah, I think it's an opportunity, but it's also a responsibility. That's what we're really talking about here, right? The, the responsibility of the artist to figure out 
something they can, the world can see as something useless, something completely minute, something that it's in, you, you, instead in going in, the, in, in depth, and this is something that we talked about, right, when we came to your, to your studio, how you can spend months just figuring out the jigs they can do, they can help you do what you do. It's not very different from you going around your sculpture and pulling here and pulling there and pulling. It's the same figure. It's the same figure, right? So I want and it's the same to responsibility. About that because I think it makes me think of the, the, it makes me think of this idea of post-user occupancy, like the data collected after a building has been inhabited. How do you know how a building is unless you've actually been in the building and then experienced that building and or a more contemporary model collected a set of data through like sensors and then fed that back into your next digital model. And and I feel like in some ways the, the, the possibility of make and the kind of process of making is that feedback loop. It's that feedback loop between the the and whether it's something that you're doing with your hand or your eye or in any number of ways, it becomes a kind of cyclical, whether we call it obsessive or not obsessive, it, it, becomes, right. it becomes the core of the investigation. Right, and you, you are in that process <coughs> the entire time. Yes. From the beginning, to the testing, to the making, to the evaluation, so on and so forth. In architecture, we're on the risk of, of right now, of doing just a little piece of it, in the middle, somewhere in the middle, right? for the sake of that photograph that is published on Instagram or someplace else, right? Because in the end, then the architect creates a shape, then engineers and, and fabricators and industrial fabricators figure out how to make it, and then clients and politicians deal with the consequences. <laughs> but the architect only deals with the consequence of that thing being done, photographed, published, and that is, so if anything, you only want to improve on how that looks, the next project looks on the next photograph, right? So this responsibility of being with the work from the very beginning, with this baby, from the embryo all the way until you're alive, is basically what we're talking about here. And then you know if it really works or not. Huh? And then you know whether it works or not. Right. I mean, like Cal Charlie I mean, in architecture school here, so it's very obvious, I suppose. But I remember hearing some people talking about, oh, that Cal Charlie, oh, that's so unpleasant, oh, it's so terrible. Oh, like, it's a beautiful it's a building, right? It's like, oh, but he's just a problem. Like, you know, you don't know who the contractor was. Like, he made the picture, it's what he's known for, right? And then who knows what he was hired to have to do with it? Like, I don't know, maybe he did choose that, but do you know what I mean? And that, like, I mean, architects don't necessarily get to go through that process right. for a lot of practical reasons. But um, also, I feel like to select, so that you are through, like, putting me right through the whole process. You know, it's like, what's it? Along, I mean, I, I think that getting getting our head around what I, I think that and that the root of the problem for me is is this idea of progress, and. Uh, means ends calculations. And I, I'm not sure if I agree completely. I think that artists perform a different type of research than scientists. Even though, I mean, I, I, I love it when the conversation falls apart because we behave differently. I think, I, I think that um, we all have different approaches to what we think progress means um, and the exchanges that we go through to achieve certain, certain goals. And, I, the relationship between kind of a, a material diligence in, in a practice and how kind of abstract those goals can be. There's something there, I think. And if, you, if a lot, a lot of times when I, like a caller talking to engineers, you know, there are very clear criteria about what success and progress and you know something working is. And I, I'm sure I'd like to hear. I mean, I'm sure you can. All have different experiences talking to engineers. Like, how do you, how do you all reconcile this kind of abstract goal, maybe that you're going for? And speaking to someone who has a, a, a different set of criteria. Let's say. So, I mean, I, I'm just gonna. Well, I'll, I'll jump off that, but then 
I, I work with a lot of engineers, and I also teach with engineers, and I think a lot about engineering, and I think that possibility of having a correct answer is a radical disciplinary difference. Maybe I'll take um, a minute to jump in before we send questions out to the, to the room. But um, as an institution here that is operating in a sort of critical intellectual studio and also has a place of making that's supposed to substantiate the work of that studio, um, maybe you could each talk just briefly about your studios, your places of making, how they've evolved along with your work, or, or vice versa, how things have changed between you and the places that you make them through the years. Mike, sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I used to have a shop with all kinds of tools and all this stuff, and you know, everything you need to make, but mostly in metal stuff. Um, and then uh, the big problem was that uh, basically you're only going to make holes with a drill press. There's nothing else you can do with the drill press besides make holes. So uh, if you want to make holes, fantastic, but uh, it felt like it foreclosed everything else. So I, I got rid of everything. Um, basically, in my studio now, I can put all of my tools in cabinets, uh, and I don't have to look at them. So I can walk into a room and do anything, instead of having to walk into a room and do something, holes, or cut something, or, you know, if I have to cut something, I can, I can do it, but um, I just found that totally claustrophobic and just panic conducive to, to be married to all this stuff. So I think of my studio as a prototyping facility and everything is set up so that everything is kind of interchangeable unit that can be swapped out and, and rearrayed as a different type of prototype. Um, one thing that has struck me in terms of a comic arcade is the issue of scale and one-to-one. -one. I think one of the great challenges of making in contemporary societies and artists is that the spaces, architectural spaces, are vastly um, out of proportion with the human body and therefore the small rooms that we most often work in. And so the problem of filling is a great problem that is um, daunting at best. And one of the things that the computer and the prototype can able to do is to not have to make a one-to-one -one in your not huge Bilbao scaled space. <laughs> well, coming to me, that's my studio at Bilbao. <laughs> um, I have um, a studio, um, and sometimes I have a regular assistant um, because there's a lot of correspondence that happens when you're working with lots of different materials, and it's something that takes over your life pretty much. And um, you know, sometimes you make money, sometimes you're not. You know, it's difficult. It's very difficult. So I would say everything like when you say swap out, <laughs> there's you know, um, people sometimes work on a project, and then there's a whole bunch of interns, or I can actually afford to like hire some people with really you know certain skills, or I'm working in a museum or a warehouse for the site eventually, like the Lincoln Center, we work in New Jersey in their giant warehouse. And um, so it can be on site, or it can be um, in my studio, and I try to stay away from the computer as much as possible because I do want to have a tactile experience. I think I'm better at that than where I would want to be. Or, um, and then everything in my studio is on wheels. So I would say that's the primary thing. And then I always have a grid with ceiling. Um, which are just model fuel and clothing, like a canal street, I'm just kidding. And it's, it's heavy duty enough. Um, but I'm working on that or not, it's up there. I'm always reminded of that. Why am I doing something up there? But it's there. Um, but it's kind of put, like, and it's on the ground floor. It took years and years to find a place on the ground floor, and more elevators, more stairs. And, and not that everything in my past collapses, very, you know, very small. Um, and she could get through a door, a normal passage. Um, so there's a lot of time spent on 
constructions and guides and photographs and I'm talking about crates, you know, crepes, being like sarcophagi or the afterlife, or instructions and stuff like that. So I have a first world problem. I have two studios. <laughs> and I never know where what I should do with even one. But coincidentally, my studio on 20th Street is the fourth floor. So I get, I think it's a great way of uh, not having to belong to a gym, so I climb stairs constantly during the day. And it used to be my apartment, just at this apartment. <laughs> so he was a tenant of ours. He was my landlord. <laughs> so now that studio has great vibes, and I've got a lot of inspiration because there's an aura in my studio when I go into my studio. But I do think, and I have a studio on the North Fork of Long Island, which is larger, and I can open doors, I'm working in the woods. I like the loneliness of the studio. That's one reason I have degrees in architecture, but I chose to practice or look at architecture from the vantage point of an artist because I love being alone. I don't, I'm not so good collaboratively. Um, I like the loneliness of the studio, and the studio for me is a really sacred space. Um, it can be a space of solitude and energy. I can, uh, if I want to change, Ideas. I switch the music from, you know, one type of music to another type of music. It might have been the right frame of mind, um, um, and um, um, and also tools are really important to me in my studio because sometimes I love the sound of a tool and it generates ideas for me. And I remember recently buying a um, um, a 22 gauge pin nail, a pneumatic. 22 gauge pin nailer, and it was so, the sound was so wonderful, and the and the nails were so thin, they were like little, really thin, like almost like thin, so that I could I could mock stuff up with quarter inch or even three sixteenth inch plywood, and drive the pins through the edge of the plywood without splitting it or even basswood and just glue and pin, and I can mock stuff up very quickly. And I think that's something, because it, it seems like we're, you're looking at the results of what we think is, quote, good work, or at least I do. This is great work, but, you know, so you're looking at the results. But there's a lot of work that comes out of, like, and I'm sure um, all of us do rough drafts. And I remember going to a lecture fairly recently that Jennifer Egan, who's a wonderful writer, um, and I think she won a Pulitzer for a visit from the Goon Squad, which is a wonderful book, and just did a, another book called um, Manhattan Beach. She said the first draft is like thousands of pages long, done by hand, and it's crap, and it's not good. The fear of doing something in your studio, and I know for students especially, you have to come up with this great idea. Don't worry about it. The first ideas can be really, really bad. And if you are work with that word obsession, you stick with it. And they will slowly become profound. The more iterations, the more yellow traced layers that you build on top of the original bad drawing, or the layers in Photoshop, or AutoCAD, or SolidWorks, or Rhino, it's, those are all tools, and you should enjoy the tools. I love Photoshop. As much as I love my Bosch jigsaw and my 22 gauge pin nailer, for me, there's no distinction between the computer tool and the pin nailer. And I work with them intermittently, and I love the pencil, but I, I, I love these pencils. And the pencil has to feel good in my hands, it has to have the right smell, the texture, the surface of the paper. Same thing in the computer, I think, although I'm a, more of a visceral person because I like the sound of things and the smells of materials. I love working, when I'm working in my studio, I'm working with cedar. It exudes a beautiful smell to it. And I think part of the act of architecture is making drawings that aren't as visceral. But they can be. I mean, you can make, uh, maybe most people don't make chipboard models anymore. Or if you do their laser cut and they're premeditated before you cut them, mm -hmm. rather than just taking out a a Stanley utility knife and hacking away at it and gluing something up and generating form in service to program I'm all for. Anyway, it's a long-winded story about my studio, which I think is a really sacred space. But one thing I'm always telling my students who are graduating and they're used to 
really great tools. I'm teaching at Parsons. We have really good wood shops and metal shops and sewing machines. You can make amazing work in a studio that's the size of a kitchen table. So don't let the studio or the tools get in the way of doing great work and working all the time. I mean, don't stop working. When I started after I graduated School of Architecture in 71 from RISD, and I came to New York, I didn't know what to do. So I said, I'm going to plot my hours just like I punch a card in a factory. And I'm going to work at this table at 615 Hudson Street, my first studio on the third floor, in a little corner. And I'm going to sit there for eight hours every day. And I would write down, I'd list on a piece of paper the time. If I got up to have lunch, that didn't count for eight hours a day. If I didn't get eight hours for six, five days a week, I worked on the weekends. And I think then I got started, and then the time went by itself. So I think that's really, I'm, uh, I'm sounding like a teacher. Don't be intimidated by lecturers. Because you, right? I'm sure you've had yeah. a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And if you can have all of that, then the exciting days when they're really successful would mean that much. Let's see, it's already 3 o'clock, but if there are a couple of questions that are burning over there, bring them on. Anybody? Yeah, example, um, in your, uh, when, they didn't, when it didn't work in the kiln, and you changed to the silicone, can you just go into specifics about how you got over that yourself, I suppose? And the specifics of yeah, what that meant to you and how it did it reach the final expression? So I have the great fortune and difficulty of working with people who like to try new things. And so there is a technical the technical expert at that particular factory became a, a friend and he was really excited about trying this out. And I also worked with a consulting structural engineer who also was really curious. And this, this gentleman at, at this, this fabrication facility was in charge of the ovens and the tempering. And, you know, we went up there, spent a week up there in, in the, in Toronto, outside Toronto, um, watching, tracing the process of the, of the piece going through its cataclysmic failure. And I think it was just extraordinarily um, stressful on a, on a personal level. And at the same time, the intent was not to have that bond be that bond. The intent was something much greater. The problem there was not to make sure that that glue actually worked. Uh, that was the that was the kind of specific. That was one of many little details that actually became a huge detail. But in that process was an extraordinary amount of learning. And when I look back on what happened, I now say, ah, expansion coefficients in class. If I'm going to use V-bond, if I'm going to use SG interlayer, if I'm going to use PVB, and I'm going to bond it to some other material. Have to think about not just how it's acting in the world, but also how it is for being formed. What are the processes through which it is being formed? So I think it, it it was a very notable failure. It was a great failure. It was also incredibly stressful and, and <laughs> distressing. Am I happy now? <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's probably like a little too close to a lot of people's reality here in terms of time frames and major things. But I also think it's great advice in general, um, sort of perspective on professional slash artistic practice of people that you meet. You know, we are a community of architects and designers. We admire, we admire each other deeply. But the people who will be your heroes are, are often the people who are not architects. They are the people in other practices and professions that can just rise up to the sort of level of abstract thinking and, and that you're making of things. Um, I think that's like, for those who haven't been out in the field yet, it's something to finish school for. <laughs>
Um, what are the reasons for that? Yeah. Right? Um, thank you, to everybody.